This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel. Let them help you plan the best Disney vacation you've ever had. Email them today at communicorweekly at fairygodmothertravel.com. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And we seem to spend a lot of time in in Florida during our history segments, but this is one of those times we're going to go a little outside of the Orlando area, I think. We don't do that often. The Orlando box? Yeah, the box of Orlando. I know sometimes you get boxed into a certain category and you can't get out of the box. Uh, Which We we don't want to be box people is what we're saying. No, we'll be... No, we don't want to be box people at all. No, we want to be something else. Yes, we always are. We're the good people. Um, All right, anyway, so history? Yeah, let's do it. It's time for Theme Park History. When you think about Florida tourism and how it's changed over the past 100 years, obviously Disney is one of the first groups that come to mind. But there's another park that we've mentioned occasionally on Communicore Weekly that is probably an even larger influence than Disney. Now, the original owner of the park is sometimes referred to as Mr. Florida because of his tireless promotion of Florida tourism. And also, he's the first person in the world to completely, uh, to successfully complete a jump on water skis from a wooded ramp. And, you know, based on that, you may think that his first name is Dick. And you'd be right. But his full name is not Dick Nudis. So, any thoughts? George? Bueller? Anyone? Oh, me? Okay. Mm-hmm. So we don't want to keep the loyal cadets in suspense any longer, but we're talking about Dick Pope Sr. and Cypress Gardens. And currently, Cypress Gardens is part of Legoland, but for more than 70 years, it was a staple of Florida tourism. And Dick Pope Sr. is credited with reviving Florida tourism after the Great Depression. And, and most people think about water skiing and Southern Bells when Cypress Garden is mentioned. But before we get into the history of Cypress Gardens, let's talk about the Popes a bit. So Dick Pope Sr., and from now on, we're just going to refer to him as Pope from now on. Uh, he was born in Des Moines, Iowa on April 19, 1900. So obviously this makes him a contemporary of Walt Disney, and it's kind of interesting to see how their lives mirrored each other. So the Popes moved to Lake Wales, Florida in 1908, which is about 30 minutes away from where Cypress Gardens would eventually be. And Pope also spent time in New York and North Carolina, where he met his wife, Julie, while golfing in Asheville. And Pope's father worked in real estate, and Pope joined him. Uh, Rumor is that he made his first real estate deal at the age of 12. And during the Great Depression, Pope and his brother found moderate success promoting speedboats and aquaplanes throughout central Florida. And during the 1920s, Pope would ski behind the boats in order to promote the sale of them. He tried different tricks in order to create more excitement. And in 1928, he became the first person to complete a jump on water skis. He jumped a wooden ramp and went a distance of 25 feet. So as a short aside, uh, water skiing was invented in 1922 by Ralph Samuelson on Lake Pepin in Lake City, Minnesota. And he used a pair of boards and skis, and his tow rope was actually a clothesline. So back to Pope, uh, Pope and his wife had two children, Dick Jr. and Adrian. So Dick Jr. would join the family business and is also credited as being the first person to ever ski barefoot. Uh, and even though Pope was a fantastic skier, He was really more known for his promotion, especially when it came to water skiing. So Pope was one of the first inductees in the Water Skiing Hall of Fame. He also hosted two World Water Ski Championships, uh, one in 1950 and one in 1958. And additionally, he presented several water skiing expositions at the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair. So 
around the same time that Pope was showing off his skiing skills as he and his brother were selling boats, uh, Pope's wife showed him an article from Good Housekeeping magazine. The article mentioned a South Carolina man that charged $2 a person to tour his landscaped estate. And apparently the guy made $36,000 in just three months. And uh, this led Pope to acquire several acres of land and a shuttered boat club on Lake Eloise. But he quickly realized that it was going to take a lot of work and a lot of money to turn the swampy area into a tourist attraction. Lake Eloise was part of the 100 Lakes Yacht Club that was formed in the early 1920s. In 1924, the club built a clubhouse on the eastern shore of Lake Eloise, which was about you know 1,160 acres of lake. They offered motorboat races with heavy, heavy cypress boats powered by inboard motors. In 1926, there was a Florida land bust and the clubhouse was closed. And it actually sat unused until Pope leased it, at first at least. Um, the building was redecorated with cypress paneling and used as a tea room in a souvenir shop. And Pope decided to approach the local commission that managed the canals in the area about connecting Lake Eloise with other bodies of water nearby. He talked about a community park and got the commission to invest $2,800 in the project. He also incorporated it as a nonprofit and applied with the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA, to construct the park. And the WPA toured the area and agreed. So Pope had federal relief workers clearing brush, laying out walkways, and improving the canals. Pope received, uh, received $5,000 from the WPA. And Pope was quoted as saying, At $1 a day for labor, you can get a lot of work done for $5,000. So even though the gardens weren't officially open, Pope began letting visitors roam the pathways in 1933 free of charge. And eventually, the WPA caught wind that the park was more of a private venture and actually pulled their funding and their workers. So at the time, Pope was called the Swami of the Swamp and the Maharaja of Muck. He still wanted to open the park and brought in Verdon Rudder, uh, a gardener from Tennessee, to begin planting. Pope even brought in uh, Robert Dalgreen, a photographer, to ensure the gardens were laid out so that every single angle would be appealing. And canals were dug out, mostly by hand, and reinforced with wooden walls. And most of the muck removed was loaded onto construction boats, again by hand, and then hauled away. Many of the paths were built of large wooden blocks of cypress, and most were infected by a fungal attack, which caused a pecky issue. And mainly, it's that there were burrows or cavities in the wood. But once the tree was felled, the fungus attacks actually stopped, and several miles were laid, and they were expected to last for at least 100 years. Cypress Gardens opened on January 2, 1935, and was known as a botanical garden. And much like Walt Disney, Pope was made fun of by his contemporaries as he was planning and building Cypress Gardens. When Cypress Gardens opened, it was around 15 acres, and you know we found conflicting reports of it being somewhere between 12 and 16 acres officially. Um, but as soon as Cypress Gardens was officially open, Pope deluged the media with photos of the gardens in newspapers and in magazines across the country. And he would even have the gardens featured prominently in several films and television shows. Yeah, there were quite a lot of films. Uh, one of the first ones was Moon Over Miami in 1941, Glimpses of, Glimpses of Florida, which was a documentary from 41, Aqua Capers in 1947, On an Island with You in 1948, and this is Cinerama, which was a, a preview show from 52, Easy to Love in 1955, Aquatic Wizards from 1955, which was a documentary on water skiing at Cypress Gardens and nothing to do with Hogwarts, Deep Adventure from 1957, Sea Hunt from 58 to 61, which was a television show, Hole in the Head from 1959, Esther Williams at Cypress Gardens in 1960. And this one was about a Mideastern prince who visits Cypress Gardens with his harem and shows interest in Esther Williams, who is there making a television show. Kind of weird. And then Grace is Gone with John Cusack was 2007 and something called H2O Extreme from 2009. So even though Pope and his brother were well known for their water skiing prowess, how did the water skiing shows at uh, Cypress Gardens actually get started? Well, a lot of the promotional um, images of Cypress Gardens featured water skiers, especially young ladies. So during World War II, when Pope was actually serving his country in the military, a small group of soldiers from a nearby training camp, uh, they arrived at the park one weekend to see the water show. 
and they were even ready to pay in, for admission just to see the show itself. So Julie Pope, uh, Dick Sr.'s uh, wife, rounded up her kids, Dick Jr. and Adrian, and a group of their friends to perform an impromptu ski show. And then the next weekend, over 800 soldiers came to see the show. So obviously the water ski shows would become a staple. And besides water skiing, the other most iconic image would be of the Southern Bells just hanging out around the gardens. Well, in 1940, a flame vine, a type of plant, outside the entrance was killed by a freeze. The gardens inside the park had been protected from that freeze. But people would approach the front gate, see the dead plant, and assume that the gardens were just as dead. So, uh, pretty girls from the office staff were asked to don old-fashioned dresses and stand in front of the dead flame tree to distract the visitors. And it worked so well that Southern Bells became a permanent fixture at the gardens. Just look the other way. That's what, that's the old <laughs> adage. So Pope knew that freezes could damage the garden, so he made sure that there were heaters there to keep the plants safe. So in 1958, there were hundreds of oil-fired grove heaters in the park. Uh, but the natural lakes and canals also helped to keep the plants from suffering from the frost. And according to an article, article from the 1980s, Cypress Gardens took potential freezes very seriously. At the time, they had seven staffers dedicated just to constantly check with the weather service. Now, this was before smartphones and weather apps, so you can imagine how long that took. Um, and their first line of defense were sprinklers that sprayed 60 to 70 degree water over the gardens at about an inch an hour. That way, the water couldn't freeze the plants. And so when the temperature dropped to or below 35 degrees Fahrenheit, the next line was the heaters. There were over 1,200 oil-fired heaters and 250 natural gas heaters all over the park. And most were set up near the wide open spaces of the gazebo garden, and then some were about 20 to 30 feet along the different trails. And some of the heaters were 30 feet or more above the ground. The article also quotes that there were four hard freezes and 18 frosty nights during that winter season alone that cost the park around $65,000. Now, during most of the park's first decade or two, it was really a botanical garden. And it's been referred to as Florida's first theme park, but if it's compared to most theme parks, it was always a garden. And that would change somewhat with the introduction of Walt Disney World in 1971. Always a tireless supporter of Florida tourism, Pope welcomed Disney with open arms. But changes to how families vacationed, as well as the gas crisis, uh, would force Cypress Gardens to make drastic changes. But we'll talk more about that in part two of our look at Cypress Gardens. Yes, and we'd love to know if you've ever had a visit to Cypress Gardens or if you remember any of those water skiing shows or Southern Bells. Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a, geek, he's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Hi. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is The Disney Story by Aaron Goldberg. And The Disney Story is one of those books that I'm so glad that someone wrote. Uh, in my opinion, it's a very unbiased read on the Disney company. And the book itself is backed up by primary sources that's really great for all levels of Disney enthusiasts, so to speak. So Goldberg has written a book that takes us on a journey through the high marks, so to speak, of Disney history. And it's a great title for anyone who wants a good overview of Walt and his entertainment empire. And the Disney story isn't just a book for people who are new to Disney history, but for anyone who's interested in learning more, especially in a very non-confrontational, non-academic tone, because you know some Disney history books, though, can be a little overwhelming. Uh, Goldberg has a very relaxed writing style and has really spent time exploring Disney history in order to offer us this condensed book. Uh, again, this isn't a bad thing at all. Uh, he's offering a way for Disney enthusiasts to gain a better understanding of their beloved company. And he's also presented this book sort of in two ways. Uh, one of them is that he's reprinted articles from media outlets verbatim. And then, additionally, he's offering the Disney Story website as a larger repository of articles. So he does include original scans of the articles for further reading at the website. And sort of, he doesn't really link to them, but he has a bibliography that points you to the website. And it's the Disney Story is a unique way of recounting Disney history. It's a reader, so it sort of gives you an idea of how the media wrote and what the media thought about Disney at the time. And of course, Goldberg takes us decade through decade and highlights the major events. 
you know, films, parks, attractions, personnel, technological breakthroughs. And uh, he covers the company. So the starting point is, you know, in 1928 with the first Mickey short. And he takes us through 2016 in the opening of Shanghai Disneyland. And, of course, uh, many, many defining moments in the company's history are examined as well. So the Disney story really is a treasure simply because of the collected articles. And the associated website does offer a look at the full text scans uh, and the articles used in the book, which is really a unique insight into how the, the company evolved and changed and how the media saw it. And personally, I stand firm that the way to become a Disney historian is to read. And not just reading blogs, but actually looking at the source material. And in most cases, you can really you can rely on books, since most people don't have the skill set yet to really peruse digital archives. But still, you can lose yourself in the world of books about Disney, and as long as you're critical of the author and the publisher, you know, you'll know you have a good work. And in this case, I have a lot of respect for Goldberg and what he's trying to do. And unlike some historians who are just glorified storytellers, Goldberg has researched his facts and can back them up. So if you want a great introduction to the history of the company, then no look then look no further than <laughs> the yeah, don't look no further than the story, the Disney story. Well, I totally messed that one up with that phrase. Uh, you know, well read enthusiasts are gonna enjoy the book and uh, newbies to Disney history are going to love it, but all around, I think it's a great book. So this week's book is The Disney Story, chronicling The Man, the Mouse, and the Parks by Aaron H. Goldberg. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window of the week. So this week's window is a little bit different. In fact, it's not even at a Disney theme park. Instead, it's actually located at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida, in the Hollywood area of the park. I know, it's crazy, right? Um, so you'll, you'll find it near the Horror Makeup Show, and it actually reads, uh, Heartfelt Universal Couriers, Jonathan Kamei, Anthony Lorero, Xavier Serrano, Shane Tomlinson, Louis Vilma, and Jared Wright. Since... 2016, carrying messages of peace, love, and hope to the stars. And apologies if I said any of those names wrong, especially because of how heartfelt uh, the meaning behind it is. Um, the window actually pays tribute to the memory of all the Universal employees who were victims of the unfortunate Pulse nightclub tragedy a few months back. So this really was a big deal that Universal went out of their way to pay tribute to their employees. Um, so Jonathan worked on La Vaz Kids, which was a Spanish TV show similar to The Voice that actually filmed at Universal Orlando. Uh, Anthony moved to Orlando from Puerto Rico to pursue a, a career in dancing and choreography. Xavier was an entertainer at uh, area theme parks, and he also performed in Universal's Superstar Parade. Shane was a local simmer, singer I'm sorry, who performed with his band Frequency. Uh, Lewis uh, was adored by his co-workers at both Disaster and the Harry Potter and Forbidden Journey rides. And uh, Jared worked at Universal Studios Florida in merchandising in uh, Walt Disney World. So a big kudos to Universal Orlando for honoring their employees with such like a really loving tribute. And uh, also, yeah, I mean, a shout out to Cadet Rain for actually pointing this out to us as well, because this is like a really cool thing that Universal did. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. <laughs> so there's this new shop at Disney Springs that's called Tag Travel. And above the registers, there's a list of arriving and departing flights. All of them, they pay homage to Disney stuff. Um, and it's a long one, so uh, here we go. So uh, the first departure destination is flight DL-601 to Anaheim at gate 55. So of course, Anaheim is the home of Disneyland for the DL, uh, which opened up in 1955, uh, the gate. Uh, and then the next flight is OL-874 and is heading to Tokyo at gate 83. So in 1983, Tokyo Disneyland opened up, and the OL and the flight number pays tribute to the Oriental Land Company, which is the, the actual operator of Tokyo Disneyland. Moving on is flight HK-566 to Lantau Island on Gate 5, which is paying tribute to Hong Kong Disneyland, which opened up in 2005. And the park is located on Lantau Island, and one of, which is one of the islands surrounding Hong Kong. Flight SD-2170 is heading to P uh, Pudong at Gate 16, and that's a nod to Shanghai Disneyland, which opened this year, 2016, uh, in the city of Pudong. And below that is flight ED-192, which is traveling to Mam 
Love Valley, whatever French, uh, at Gate 92, which is obviously a tribute to Disneyland Paris, which opened up as Euro Disneyland, uh, so that's where the ED comes from, in 1992. And Flight MK 1971 to Bay Lake at Gate 71 pays tribute to Walt Disney World Resort, the Magic Kingdom, which sits on Bay Lake and opened up in 1971. So it's a lot in that small little area. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of tributes for Tag That's Trevor. a lot of tributes all in one goat, definitely. I know. A multi-faceted a, goat is what it yeah, is. Yeah, I was going to say a multi-goatal goat, but multi, I guess that does. Multi-goatal goat, that's a good one. I like that one. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. No, that's fine, though. No, yeah. Neither do we. Anyways, I, I'm so tired from all the goats, I don't even a good segue for the year of a million or so limited time cadets weekly prize winner announcement. So we'll just go into it. Works hey, for me. That'll work. So for those of you who aren't aware, every single week on Communicore Weekly for the past two seasons, we've been giving away a wonderful prize to one lucky cadet. All you have to do is email communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name and address so we can get the prize mailed to you, and we'll enter you into the drawing. And this week, we are, well, Teresa Corey from Fairy Godmother Travel is giving you away a wonderful Fairy Godmother Travel prize pack. I almost said travel pack, which is slightly different. Sli- very different, so, actually. Very different. So this week's winner is Brendan P. from San Francisco, California. Hooray! Yay! Congratulations. So Brandon, uh, Brennan, not Brandon. I am so sorry. Brennan. Brennan, Brennan, Brennan. So Brennan, when you get your prize, take a photo. Hit us up on Twitter or Facebook. We'd love to see it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, guys. So that means we've reached the end of the show. So thank you so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. However you get the show, leave us a comment. uh, Rate us on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. And email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com to say hi or enter the contest. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicoreweekly. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Oh, and Periscope. I'm at Imagineerding. He's at Jeff Heimbuck. Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. And visit the Communa store at CommunicoreWeekly.com where you can buy some incredible Communicore Weekly merchandise, especially some great t-shirts. And there's still a couple of weeks left to get your official cadet membership card or sticker. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And make sure you visit patreon.com slash Weekly to find out how you can support the greatest online show. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Moving rice. <laughs>